Yay! Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. That's Romans 12. If you don't have a traditional Bible and you want to use one, just raise your hand and one of these people will bring you one. You can either borrow that or you can keep it. It's our gift to you. If, or you can open up the uh, Bible app on your smart device and all the notes and scriptures have already been uploaded. If you're watching us live online or at one of our services at the Brown County Correctional Facility, love you guys and so glad that you are part of our family. And you guys on this beautiful day, you got rain soaked yesterday. I was loving it. If you know me, you know that rain is my favorite weather. I don't know why. I just love the rain. And so now that the sun is out, thank you so much for making this a part of your weekend. And I hope to see you if you are in the valley. Uh, would love to see you guys on Wednesday and just get to spend some time with you. Just let me give you a little uh, heads up, a little update. Pastor Sonny and I and our kids, we are not going to be here at all for the month of June. We've never done this. We've never just taken like an extended time away. And here's why. Listen, I want just open your ears, elbow your neighbor real quick and tell them open their ears. We are not resigning. We're not like quitting. We're not taking a sabbatical because we're praying about whether or not we want to stay. We're not like pulling away. We're pressing in. Like we're ready to take this region and bring the life-giving message of Jesus, as you heard Pastor Sonny say, all over the place. And we have several other places that aren't in the 920 that want to be a part of what God is doing here. But I'm so excited because the next series that we're doing after today, I named it it's called Young Guns, and I'm so psyched about it. I'm so, I'm so excited. It's, it's four young people, four of our young communicators. We're not bringing people from the outside. We just have four of our young communicators. We have Pastor Brady, who does our teens. We have Pastor DJ, who you've met many times. We have Pastor Danielle, who's in Club 252, our kids' ministry right now. And we have Pastor Dallas, who, by the way... If you ask him, ask him about his hair. He's in love with his own hair right now. He's so excited. He told Pastor Sunday night this week, he said, you know what? I walked by a mirror this week. I realized I'm a good-looking man. I was like, <laughs> all right, go ahead with your bad self, Eddie Vedder. And so he's just there. And, and I hope that they make the promo the way that I asked them to. I want them to use the Bon Jovi song. Oh, my cowboy on a steel horse I ride. You know what I'm talking about? And I hope that they're like walking with the long coat and the shotgun and all this stuff. And except Pastor Brady said, uh, wait, Young Guns is a movie? He almost got cut from the team. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so anyway, super excited about that. So for four weeks. And so we're, we're going on an RV trip. We're going to the Black Hills of South Dakota, a.k.a. Clark Griswold. And I'm going to put the sunscreen on my nose. I already got my socks and sandals, got my Keens picked out, and I got my black socks to pull up extra high and not Nike socks either. I'm talking about the compression socks that make your blood. It's just, just, I don't need them. I just want to embarrass my kids. And so anyway, <laughs> we're in the last week of this series, and I've been loving it. It's been a difficult series for me. I don't know. If it has been for you, it's been in response to a survey where thousands of people were just asked what they wanted talked about in church. And, and obviously with that many people, the specifics may have been different. But what's been interesting is that when you took all of those different responses, the similarities were so close in the theme that people wanted to have dealt with. And that theme was just surviving difficult times. And today, in my humble opinion, is actually the most difficult of all the difficulties. So today I want to kind of close this thing out by, by talking about dealing with difficult people. Let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you that you deal with difficult people every second of every day. Thank you that you are a patient God, that you are a loving God, that you are a kind God, and that you are a teaching God. And so today I pray that our hearts would be changed, that they would be transformed into what it is you want them to be in Jesus' name. Amen. So dealing with difficult people. <laughs> you don't know any difficult people, do you? I hope, hopefully it's not your spouse. Hopefully it's not your kids. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe uh, it's a neighbor. But whoever that is, we all know somebody who is a difficult person. And, and I just want you to know today that I know what it is that you want. You, you, you're hoping right now, when you heard the title, you were like, oh, I hope he brings a message that'll help that person. I hope he brings a message that'll change that person. Well, I'm sorry to say, that 
probably not going to happen. So just lower your expectations today because the truth is if when I asked if you know somebody who's a difficult person, if you uh, elbowed somebody, then guess what? Somebody uh, probably could have elbowed you too. And we all have that person and we've all been that person, you know, who just kind of makes life interesting, makes life a little more difficult. And so I just want to tell you up front, you're not necessarily going to like this message. Uh, this is a tough one. It's not the kind of message that you'd bring if you're trying to grow the crowd in your church. It's the kind of message that you bring if you're trying to grow the people in your church, because this one's serious. Okay, so just buckle in, because this is definitely the deep end of the pool, and it's going to challenge you. It's going to be tough for some of you to swallow, but if you'll hang with me for like the next 25 minutes, this talk has the power to transform your life from the inside out. But that transformation, it's going to require something of you. And what it's going to require is surrender. We don't have to do the work or even understand the work. All we have to do is allow the work. Because if we'll allow the work, God will do the work. And so for the next few minutes, can we just open up our hearts, can we just open up our minds and see if, if maybe God might would do something inside all of us, myself included. Because can I tell you, truth be told, I know there are many times in my life where I am the difficult person to deal with. And so I want to start just with two little verses from a really practical book in Scripture. Pastor Sonny talked about this in the final week of her Proverbs study, that if you wanted to have something really good to come out of the Proverbs study and go into, you can go into the book of James. It's an incredibly practical book in Scripture that was actually written by the earthly half-brother of Jesus. Now, like if you know, uh, if you came up kind of in the evangelical church, you know this, but maybe if you came up in a different uh, strain of the church, a different vein of the church, a different uh, kind of culture of the church, you might not know this, that there's a guy named James. He wrote this book. He actually became the pastor of the largest church in the world in its time after Jesus died. But we know from Scripture that after the miraculous, immaculate conception of Jesus, Scripture tells us that Mary and Joseph were then married, and then they had other kids. Jesus actually himself refers to his half-brothers and sisters throughout the gospel. And then I, I actually was reading this week, and I, the gospels, incidentally, if you don't know this, they're just the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they're the story of Jesus. They're the narrative of Jesus' life on earth. And actually, this week I was thinking about difficult people, and I thought, <laughs> I wonder if Jesus was a difficult person person to have as a brother. Like if you, maybe you have a sibling or where one of them's the favorite. Every family thinks that somebody's the favorite and the parents treat them a little bit. I mean, how could Jesus not be the favorite? He's like, oh, he's God. Like he's God. And if you treat him badly, it feels like, like God would kill you. And like, like this, like uh, I go, um, like what would it be like to play dodgeball with Jesus? Like, like well, could he just do like the Dr. Strange thing and the ball cut the and the ball just, just falls on the ground like, what? I can't even hit him when he wasn't even looking. And the ball just, just fell on the ground. Or hide and seek with kid Jesus. Can you feel me on that? Like, can you just, like one of the girls is like, mom, Jesus is cheating. He keeps disappearing again. Anyway, I just, that's just how, like my, my she's counting. He's like, I'm not even here. He does like the Jedi mind trick. You didn't actually see me. No, <laughs> Anyway, so uh, that's just how my, my weird brain little works. Anyway, he, my point is that Jesus had earthly brothers and he had sisters. And one of them, a brother named James, wrote these words in Scripture. He said, what causes fights and quarrels among you? To which you go, well, that's easy. That's the easiest question that the Bible has ever asked. She does. Or, or, or he does. Or, or you'd say, I mean, obviously you haven't met my boss, James. Otherwise, you would have never asked that question because everybody knows it's them. But then James flips the script and he kind of answers his own question. He says, I mean, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Which then he wastes no time and gets to the root of it. And he says, you want something and you can't get it which is the source of all difficult situations, incidentally. It's literally the source of all frustration, all bitterness, all anger. All anger comes from the fact that you felt like you deserved something, but you didn't get it. 
you deserved to be treated with more respect, treated with more recognition, treated with more reward. You think, well, I work hard. I should be paid more. I should be promoted more. I, I, I should be propped up more. You, you wanted something. You deserved it even. But for whatever reason, you didn't get it. And so he goes on and he says, here's what you're doing about it. You're killing. You're coveting. You're quarreling and you're fighting. And I read that and I go, whoa, that went next level like super quick, didn't it? Like you wanted something, you didn't get it, and so you started killing people. And he's, and he's not talking about like murdering people. He's talking about like in your mind. He says like you either bow up or you clam up. You either scream at them or you shut down on them. But the truth is, whether you give them the silent treatment or whether you stink up the room with your words, what you're doing isn't working. You're still miserable, and so he gives the reason, and it's the only route to peace and reconciliation. He says, the reason you don't have what you want is because you don't talk to God about it. So like just for a couple of minutes, for like 20 minutes today, could we do that? Could we, could we instead of trying to think about how this message can change others, for just a few minutes, could we consider the possibility that, that maybe we might be the ones who need to be changed? You know, as long as you feel like the change in your life is connected to or conditional upon somebody else's life being changed, then you're taking the power for your change out of God's hands, and you're putting it in the hands of that other person. And so what I want to do today is I want to disarm other difficult people by giving you five ways to deal with difficult people. And be forewarned, these are not easy. They're super tough. And if I'm honest, most of you won't do it because you're cowards. But for those of us who have the courage to do it, for those of us who have the courage to look inside of ourselves and realize that we've been the difficult person, those, those are the people that are going to change from the inside out. So here's the first way to deal with difficult people is overlook the offense. Yeah, overlook it which is the opposite of what most people are doing in our culture because our culture is cascading in an opposite direction to this. And I'm actually concerned about it. I'm concerned about the direction that our culture is headed in. So many people are so angry. They're so bitter that if you disagree with, with them about, on just about anything, they like snap. They become totally vile. They become totally venom, venomous. And they become venomous not only to what they can't stand about your viewpoint. They get venomous because suddenly they can't stand you. It becomes so personal. And I wonder why is it that we, can overlook we can't overlook offenses, but we can so easily overlook people? Here's why. Because we've become thin-skinned and hard-hearted. But the only way to peace is to actually have tough skin and a soft heart. And so the Proverbs say it like this, love overlooks the wrongs that others do, which is super hard. I actually had to do this this week. I had a situation where somebody made me so mad that I could feel the blood rushing to my face. You ever like get so mad at somebody that the top of your head is going to explode off of that? But here's what was the problem. Like I knew that I was going to have to talk about this today. And so uh, that's super frustrating sometimes, by the way. Sometimes like when God says, I want you to talk about this. I have to be careful what I teach about sometimes because in Inevitably, the devil is going to test me. He's going to try to disqualify me. He's going to try to make me change the message before the message gets here. And I was so close this week to having to talk about something different. Luckily, God had my kids there looking at me, whispering, be calm. Like, like my kids were like, seriously, stop. Before, before they knew that I was about to click, you know what I'm saying? Uh, because in my mind, I was rehearsing all the things that I wanted to say back to that person. Oh, y'all, I could have cut them up. I could have cut, I could have carved them up. Do not mess with somebody who makes their living with their mouth. That's all I'm saying. Like, I could have just <laughs> tore that. In my mind, I tore that person down, y'all. They didn't even want to leave work that day. <laughs> I just had to walk away. Because another proverb says, when a fool is annoyed, he quickly lets it be known. But wise people, they ignore the insult. Here's another one. It says a man's wisdom gives him patience. It's to his glory that he would overlook an offense. Listen, it only helps you to overlook stuff. And I, and I know you're thinking it's almost impossible. And I agree. So what's the solution? What's the secret? It's one word, empathy. Understanding 
that they are how they are for a reason. Something caused it. Only hurting people hurt people. Like, what if we could just look at that person and say, I know they hurt me, but I know that they're hurt. I, I know that they were rude to me, but somebody was rude to them, like for a long time, or maybe somebody did something that caused them to close off. Or, or I, listen, I know they just cut me off on the highway, and all I want to do is peel the banana. You know what I'm talking about? All I want to do is give them that one finger salute. But, but listen, what if rather than thinking that they're just some jerk who doesn't care about anybody else on the highway, we think they just got the worst news of their life and they're rushing home to somebody who's in danger. What if you thought that? I mean, listen, none of that's probably true. They're probably just some jerk who doesn't care about anybody in traffic. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to help you more to think that way than your natural reaction. Plus, that's what love does. That's what empathy does. It imagines what it must be like to be that person. Have you ever seen somebody who's like just mean, they're just rude, and just looked at them and thought, Ugh, like, I'm, I'm glad I'm not like that, but we could so easily become like that? Empathy overlooks their offense. Here's the second way to deal with difficult people is pray for them. Ooh, prayer's a good weapon, y'all. Prayer is a good way to get back at somebody. Somebody treats you ugly, say, all right, sucker, you're going to find out. <laughs> Tonight at 8 o'clock, I'm going to be praying for you. <laughs> God's going to change you. God's going to get all up. Isn't it great when you don't have to say nothing, but you know that when you pray for them, the minute that you started praying for them, the Holy Spirit started messing with them. The Holy Spirit started convicting them. You ever have somebody treat you ugly, you don't say nothing, and then they come back, they're like, my bad. That was so stupid. I can't believe I, I even said that. And in your mind, you're like, hi, in your face, sucker. <laughs> Prayer is great revenge. That's all I'm saying. And some of you are thinking, I do pray for them. I pray the flies of a thousand camels will find their armpits. You know, I pray hemorrhoids on them in Jesus' name. I don't know. What, I don't even know. Did I just say that? But when you pray for them, it's not just for their benefit. Praying for someone is actually for yours. Because when you pray for someone, it softens your heart. I'm not very good at counseling, but sometimes I do marriage counseling. And so when people come in and they want to talk to me about their marriage, I have this little trick that I pull on them and I say, all right, let's, before we start talking about anything, we're going to talk to Jesus. We're going to, let's open in prayer, which most of them agree to because number one, they feel guilty if they don't. Number two, they're in a church. And number three, they know this is for free. And so they, their, their payment is that they let me pray. But then I, like I flip it on them and once they agree, I say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Sir, I want you to pray for her. Oh, that's so ugly right there. By the way, that's just nasty. That's my mom's will call that dirty pool. That's some dirty pool right there. Sir, I want you to pray for her. And ma'am, I want you to pray for him. And it's the funniest thing because usually this is how homeboy usually starts out the prayer. He said, God, I don't know why you put this wicked, foul, ugly, mean, nasty woman with me. And he'll start like cussing her out in prayer because he knows she can't say nothing because, you know, it's auto almost automatic that you go to hell if you interrupt somebody's prayer. I'm just saying, don't stand for the anthem. Wear a ball cap during the anthem. Interrupt a prayer. That's three ways to hell. That's another message for the fall. But I'm just saying, <laughs> she can't interrupt, so he's like cussing her out in the prayer. And it always starts out sour. But inevitably, as he goes along, the prayer starts to soften. Which, by the way, if you read the Psalms, David, the author of many of the Psalms, he almost always starts out salty in the first verse of a Psalm, like, God, my enemies, I hate these suckers. I wish you would kill everybody who doesn't look like me or have my middle name. Kill everybody, God. And you're like, dang, how is he a man after God's own heart? Like, he always starts out salty in the first verse, but by the last one, it always sounds a lot softer. Because the more he talked to God, the more he wanted God to have God's way than he wanted him to have his own way. That's the power of prayer. Jesus said it like this. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. In fact, the Jewish people had a law that promoted payback. It's the big payback. And it said, it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That law actually came from the Romans. The Romans were in control of their territory at that time, and the Romans worshipped a god of revenge. And the Roman god of revenge said, if someone gets you, get him back a hundred times over. In fact, that Roman god said, the more you get him back, the more you'll be blessed. And I thought, that's my god, right? That's the, you know, that's the natural way that you... And Jesus was saying, I know that's how you think you should live. But I tell you, you should love your enemies 
And you should pray for people who persecute you. And he's teaching that there's a miracle that happens when you pray for people. I just try it. I dare you while I'm gone. For the next for the next 30 days, I want you to think of somebody difficult. I want you to think of somebody who drags you down and every day for the next month. I dare you to pray for those people. Find out how God will change not just them, how God will change you. Here's the third way that we deal with difficult people is forgive them. Forgive them. And before you turn me down and tune me out, let me say this. Forgiveness is not necessarily reconciliation. Forgiveness is not minimizing what happened or saying that what happened didn't happen. Forgiveness isn't necessarily reconciliation. It's just release. It's letting God hold the bill. God looks at it and he's holding the bill. He says, I'm not asking you to forgive them because they deserve it. I'm asking you to forgive them because you deserve it. It's not to help them. It's actually to help you. And Jesus modeled this for us in his most painful moment. While Jesus was hanging on the cross, dying, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He was saying, Father, forgive these people who just slapped me and spit on me, who just drove nails in my hands and nails in my feet. Forgive these people who are mocking me and laughing at me, shouting insults and punching me in my face. And here's what's interesting. If you look at almost any picture of a, of a cross, or if you look at almost any movie of the cross, they depict it as what's called a high cross or an elevated cross. But Jewish history actually teaches us about a low cross. Jesus was not crucified on an elevated cross. History suggests that he was crucified on a cross that was at eye level. And the reason that they crucified people at eye level was to be able to maximize the insult and the injury. And so it was incredibly common to have people walking past a criminal's cross. I mean, like crucifixions happened all the time. There wasn't like one day that was crucifixion day. It was like every single day, dozens of people were being crucified. And it would be very common for somebody to walk just past some random criminal's cross and, and, and not even know why they, they were on that cross. They may not have known the criminal or, or the crime that they had committed. And yet randomly, because they were just as people, would just like reach out and strike them or spit on them. And Jesus said, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Later in the book of Colossians, St. Paul, he says this. He says, make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. And I know that's asking too much. I know that that's too hard. So he goes on and he says, don't forget this. The Lord forgave you. So you have to forgive others. Y'all, I never feel like forgiving people. I just don't, and I don't because I'm a justice-oriented person. I feel like people should get what they deserve, unless it's me, of course. I don't feel like I should get what I deserve. I should get what I want because I love me. But I think other people should get what they deserve. If somebody cuts me off in traffic, they should blow a tire and not have the money to pay for it. That's all I'm saying. If somebody flips me off in traffic, somebody ought to break their finger later. It doesn't have to be me, but I can just laugh about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the humanity of me. Aren't you glad that I don't walk in my humanity Aren't you glad you don't walk in your humanity because you know your own thoughts? I don't ever feel like forgiving people. The only way that I'm able to reconcile forgiveness is because I can't afford to let the flow of forgiveness to stop in my own life. So God's saying there's freedom in forgiveness. Like when you forgive someone, you set a prisoner free. That prisoner is you. That's why with all my heart I believe this. Forgiving someone will not change your past but it can change your future. Why don't we just try to forgive people just, just for the next 30 days? What if you just said, you know what? I'm not gonna dwell on it. And I know it's hard. I know that they dogged you out. I know that they messed with you. I know that they did stuff that's unforgivable, but release yourself. Release the prisoner that is you. Here's the fourth way to deal with difficult people is bless them. Bless them. You ever say that? Just bless them, Lord. In the South, when they think you're stupid, they say, oh, bless his heart. You know, so don't do it like that. Don't bless them like that. Don't bless them like you. And I know that blessings is kind of a churchy word, but in the Greek, the word bless means to speak well of. This is a big one. Because when you have difficult people, oh, it's so fun to gossip about them, isn't it? 
It's so fun to just get your little crew of people around and, and talk about them. It's so fun to post stuff about them on Facebook and let everybody know what a jerk they are. Go to a restaurant, have somebody mistreat you, and you want to go on Yelp or you want to go on Instagram. You take a picture of your waiter like this, try to get his name and try to tell. I've never done this. Some of y'all, though, have that. You take a picture and you go, at Jimmy Smith, what a terrible waiter. And you go, ha, I got him. And you want everybody to know what a jerk that person is. And that's, the, like, that's that toxic culture that I talked about earlier, where we think we can say whatever we want about whoever we want, wherever we want, whenever we want. Of course, as long as they're not there, because we love to cower behind a computer. We don't have the courage to confront people to their faces, and so we do it in anonymity. We, we do it where, you know, it'll tear them down, but it won't make us look bad. And so, so can I just ask that, that us, uh, just, just, touch your, just touch your arm. I don't, I don't know why I'm doing that. Just, I, want, I want you. I want you to know it. this is you. I want you and me to create a counterculture. Can we, can we just stop speaking death and start speaking life? Can we stop speaking negatively about people or political parties or about our cities or about other churches or about our neighbors or about our in-laws? Can we just bless them in Jesus' name? Can we speak well of them? <laughs> Can we either speak well of them or just not speak about them? at all. Like if something comes in your mind, can you remember the words of every grandmama who has ever lived and said, if you don't got nothing nice to say, don't say nothing at all. Jesus said it like this. I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you and bless those who curse you. He's saying, speak well of people who curse you. Wouldn't you agree that this is needed in our city, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our homes, and in our neighborhoods? And I, I know somebody's going to test you. I know somebody's going to talk trash to you or about you. But St. Peter said, don't do wrong to repay a wrong. Don't give an insult to repay an insult. Repay people with a blessing. You were called to do this so you might receive a blessing. You know how dumb it would make somebody feel if they cussed you out and you said, I love you? If somebody said something crazy about you and you said, oh, but you know what? I love your hair like that. I don't, you're like in your head, you're like, oh, I hate your attitude. I want to pull your hair out your head. But, oh boy, did you get a haircut? Have you lost weight? You're, yeah, your teeth look so white today. Just like they're cussing you out and you're blessing them. And it's like, like kids, if you're a kid in here, if you're getting yelled at by your parents, whoo, this is the best tool right here. Mama, I'm sorry, I love you. But listen, if your parents start yelling at you, here's the best way to get them to stop. Say, you're right, I'm so sorry. They'll say, Hook. <laughs> you start in the middle. They're like, I wasn't done yet. No, I didn't want your apology yet. I needed three more sentences before I got to your apology. Like, the, Let's make an agreement. Let's start speaking blessings in our homes. Let's start speaking blessings at our jobs. Let's not let our kids or our coworkers hear us trash people. Because Scripture says everything that comes out of your mouth either builds someone up or tears them down. So let's be intentional with our words. We have a God who is a speaking God. And He never speaks things the way they are. He always speaks things the way that they can become. He looked at this dark, void, unformed world and said, let there be light, and there was. So with his words, he created his world. And can I give you a little thought for today? We can also create our world with our words. We can literally go into our home today and change our world with our words. We can change our marriage with our words. We can change our kids' direction and destiny with our words. The Proverbs say the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love to talk will eat their own words. Oh, that's good. I wonder, what are you eating today? Because I want whatever words I eat to be sweet and not sour. But I can only do that when I bless those who curse me. Here's the fifth and final way to deal with difficult people, and it's probably the deepest part of the pool. You're not going to be able to touch the bottom. With every difficult person, I want you to do good to them. Do something for them or, or give something to them. 
Like, like, like what if you have a neighbor who's just ornery and ugly? What if, what if you paid for their lawn care for the summer? Or, or what if you, you hired Mosquito Squad to come and spray their yard so there's no mosquitoes? Or, or, or what if you actually took your dog to somewhere and got them trained that they wouldn't stay in your neighbor's yard or they wouldn't bark all the time? Like, do something for them or give something to them. I want to show it to you in Scripture. The book of Romans says, Don't repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible... As long as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge. Leave room for God's wrath, for it's written. It's mine to avenge. I'm going to repay him, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your neighbor's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. If he's doing this, listen to this, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head. And you read that, you go, yes! Revenge, finally, the scripture, I'm going to memorize that scripture. Burn, baby, burn. It sounds so good, doesn't it, Yori? Well, I'm going to heat burning coal. I'm going to be nice to you because it's going to heat burning coals on your head. But that's not actually what that means. In that culture, burning coals were considered the greatest commodity someone could possess. Because there were no stoves, there were no starter logs, no matches or lighters. So if you lost your fire, you had to work really hard to get it back. And so they would attempt to do everything they could to build a fire every evening that would be hot enough that it would last through the night while they slept. Because if you woke up the next morning and all your coals were out, you'd have no way to cook your food, so you'd be hungry, and no way to purify your water, so you'd be thirsty. So one of the greatest gifts that you could give to somebody was part of your burning coals. So, so this scripture is saying, heap them on them so they have to carry them on their head so that they're too heavy to carry like this, that they have to carry like this. Give them your greatest commodity. Heap burning coals on them. It's not a revenge. It's a reward because we're not supposed to overcome by evil. We're supposed to overcome evil with good. And I know what you're thinking. Those five things, that's a tough list. Now, I want to be clear. I want to be totally transparent. It's actually impossible to do unless you've been on the receiving end of those things. But what I would submit to you today is that while you were still a difficult person, this book says Jesus died for you. And to this day, Scripture says he's at the right hand of the Father, overlooking your offense, praying for you, saying, hey, Dad, let's keep forgiving him. Let's Let's keep forgiving her. He's blessing you right now, speaking well of you, saying that they don't even know what they're doing. So why don't we just do good to them, Dad? Let's heap burning coals on their head. And he did that when he gave his greatest commodity, forgiveness for you and for me. And since we have freely received, we should freely give. Because it's the forgiven who forgive. It's the blessed who bless. It's the overlooked who have somehow figured out how to overlook. And in doing those things, you will be transformed from the inside out. But that transformation requires one thing from you. It requires surrender. I just wonder if you'll do that today. Will you surrender? Would you close your eyes all across this place? Maybe you need to surrender your spirit. You need to surrender your soul. That's what the essence and the heart of salvation is. It is this giving up of our spirit, this giving up of our soul, realizing that you've tried everything that you could try spiritually and nothing has worked. And so in the midst of your struggle, you surrender. I wonder if you're here today and you haven't done that. You haven't surrendered to Jesus today. I'm going to give you opportunity to do that. To receive salvation really requires, it's one thing broken down into two parts. It requires confession and profession. Confession that you are a sinner and profession that you believe he can be your savior. And so this morning, we're going to give opportunity to do both of those things. And we're going to confess in just a moment with nobody looking around. We're going to give you opportunity to confess in public. And how you're going to do that is, is in just a moment, I'm going to ask for people to raise their hand and make eye contact with me. It's just your way of saying that I'm a sinner and I want to be saved. And it's my way of being able to see you so I can pray for you. And once you've made eye contact with me, you can put your hand down. And then after that, we're going to profess that we believe he can be our savior by everyone in here repeating a prayer after me. We're not going to stand or walk an aisle or be centered out. So if you're here today and you say, Sean, I need Jesus as my savior with nobody looking around. Would you just raise your hand and make eye contact with me today? Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Thanks. Anybody miss you? Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna pray. Everybody pray this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. I believe you can save me. Will you do that? Change my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, would you do me one favor? Just fill out that hello card that's in the seat back in front of you. Tear the bottom part off. Check the yellow box that says you're choosing to follow Jesus. You can either put it in the black buckets when they come around in just a minute, or you can take it out to the Welcome Center. But it's our chance to pray for you and our chance to follow up with you. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes uh, one more time. Don't leave yet. Pastor Sonny's going to close this out here in just a second. But I wonder if you're hearing you say, like, I'm a Jesus guy or I'm a Jesus girl. But you say either you have a difficult person in your life and you want prayer for that, or you are a difficult person in someone's life and you want prayer for that. So if there's some difficult people you have or are, would you just raise your hand so that I could pray for you today? God, for so many people in here, I don't know if they have or are, probably both. God, I pray that you would give us peace that surpasses all understanding. Help us speak life in Jesus' name. Amen.